Hi guys, this week I'm going to do a species spotlight on the Otto Sinclis, um, also known by a few other names, Otto Cat, things like that. So uh, the Otto Sinclis, they're actually native to South America, and um, the lowlands east of the Andes from northern Venezuela to northern Argentina. Um, they are mainly active during the day and in the wild they've been found living in quite large shoals over in like sandy areas within deeper sort of river water or deep within the rivers. Um, mainly they're inhabited uh, well oxygenated water within slow to moderate flowing streams um, with lots of heavy vegetation, uh, mainly leaves with quite sort of thin narrow plants with quite thin narrow leaves. Um, they spend the time uh, in the shallows there. Um, and they're found clinging to the substrate using um, the mouth as you can see what my little one's doing here they use that mouth as a sucker um, and like I said they're found in the in the shallows where they'll be grazing there on algae that's growing on any sort of rocks stones roots plants anything like that so Otto Sinclis are a um, proper <laughs> really peaceful Fish, so they're good in a community tank. Um, they are quite a small fish though. Um, their sort of maximum size can be about one and a half to two inches. So just be careful of what other fish you do put them in your tank with. Um, mine in my tank here, they're always very busy. They're always zipping around here, there and everywhere. And they're always doing just like what this guy's doing here, clinging onto either the glass, the rocks, um, the sand or the plants and they're just constantly grazing on any of the algae that's growing there. Um, every now and then I do see them sort of zip up to the surface of the water um, and I've looked into this and it's saying that they're actually um, able to take like a mouthful or, or, or a gulp of air um, and I think this is uh, in the wild if there's drought or if the water isn't as um, oxygenated um, that obviously enables them to survive in, in less oxygenated waters. So uh, pH wise they prefer a stable uh, pH than one that's fluctuating. Um, sorry about that. So um, they do prefer a stable pH over a fluctuating pH. Um, but preferably it would be 6 to 7.5. Now my water is pH of 8, um, but that is a constant, so they do seem to be sort of thriving quite well in my tank. Um, temperature wise, uh, anything from 22 to 28 degrees Celsius. So my main tank here um, goes from sort of 25 to about 27, depending on if the heating is on in the house or not. And they do prefer a water harness of 6 to 15 dH. Mine comes in at about 11. So they are a very social fish. Um, so really, the very least you should be keeping them is um, 6. Um, but preferably um, by about 10 to 15 if you can. Um, now, I had 8 originally. Um, and I am only left with 4 now. Um, Obviously it's down to the size of the tank that you've got as well. Um, you know, you do need quite a mature, um, you know, well-established tank for them. Um, so there's plenty of algae in, in the tank for them to graze and to feed off. Um, so yeah, I'm down to just four at the moment and um, I probably will add more back to him uh, in, the, in the future, but at the moment I'm keeping it at, at just the four. Um, for the amount of algae that this tank gets growing in it. So within the tank then, if you can have quite a few smooth uh, surfaces for them to graze off, so smoother rocks, a bit of bog wood, um, you know, your, your substrate. Uh, I've got mine on sand because, um, and again, looking into it, they are found over sandy banks um, in the rivers in the wild. This just helps them to sort of get a hold like you can see this little guy doing here and um, they can sort of get a good purchase with the sucker on the mouth and um, hold on to the um, to the rock or whatever it is that they're holding on to and, and, and graze 
without being sort of swept away in the flow of the water. So they do actually eat uh, soft green algae within your tank and also diatom algae, which I get that growing. You can see all this, um, you know, this sort of brown, that's diatom algae, so they do eat that as well. Um, there are some algae that they won't eat though. Um, so if I just sort of scoot over here, all this sort of, uh, this green algae, now I'm not sure if this is blue and green algae, so if any of you guys watching this can tell me what you think that sort of the more green slimy stuff is. Um, the snail eats it, but the ottos don't. Um, and the ottos also don't eat this this sort of browner fairy algae. Um, again, my snail does, but the ottos won't. So they won't eat every type of algae in your tank. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so as well as them uh, feeding off algae, you do also need to feed them as well to make sure that, you know, obviously they, they're getting enough food. So um, you can put in algae wafers. Um, now I think I've actually got the Hikari algae wafers, but since doing a bit of research, I've found out that they're not actually, they're nutritional for them. Um, so I do need to get some more Hikari wafers, but get it, not Hikari wafers, I need to get some more algae wafers, sorry. So do put algae wafers in and you can give them sort of different veg as well. So at the moment I give mine and um, there's a bit of cucumber there um, with a weight on and they're always foraging on the cucumber. You can give them anything, um, you know, any veg really like a uh, blanched spinach, courgette um, and again like I said I, I put cucumber in for mine as well. Um, if you do put any veg in, don't leave it in there for more than three days though, because obviously that's going to start to decompose and you don't want it to affect you, your water quality in your tank. Now a good sign of a good healthy um, full Otto Sinkless is they get um, nice little pot bellies. So when they're stuck on the glass, um, you should be able to see um, these quite cute really, they, they do get quite round pot bellies and you also want to make sure that their colours are really nice and bright and bold. So when you're buying Ottos from shops, um, always worthwhile asking them how long they've had them in stock for. If they've only just come in, I'd be a little bit wary because Ottos, I don't think they're, they're delicate fish but um, they are, um, I can't think of the word. They're sort of prone to like dirty water and, and stress and things like that. So obviously when they're being shipped, um, it's quite a stressful time for them. Um, if you go to your uh, fish shop there and they say that they've had them in for a week or two, you know, chances are that they're going to be quite healthy or whatever. Otto's can tend to sort of pass away sadly within the first few days of purchasing them just because of the stress of being caught and shipping and everything like that. So there we go, you can see this little one, he's doing the, um, you know, you can see his little mouth working there. I'll just see if I can zoom a bit closer without it going out of focus, yeah? And don't know if you can see there on the front, they've actually got these tiny little spikes just on the, the well I don't want to say snout, but you know what I mean, on the nose area. <laughs> they have got quite big eyes as well. Um, and if you do have to net your auto sinkless for anything, just be aware, they do have quite sharp the sort of spines in their pectoral fins. I'm not sure if it's the dorsal fin as well. Um, so just be aware if they feel threatened, they might just stick those fins out and they might just get caught or snagged in your nets. I know this because I accidentally sucked, got one stuck in my siphon when I was doing a water change. And when I tried to, um, I got him like sort of side on. And when I tried to pull him out, he stabbed me with these spikes. So there we go. I suppose I deserved it for getting him caught in the siphon. I was trying to save him then. <laughs> now, um, to tell the sex of these is quite difficult. Um, and it is very sort of rare that they do um, breed in your tank. Um, I think the females, like with most fish, the females are probably a little bit bigger and they're more rounded. Um, and when the female is ready to breed, apparently she will sort of swim up and down plants quite quickly. The males will be following it and then they go into sort of a T-shape um, and she will release eggs and a bit like how Corydoras do, 
um, which I didn't realise. I learnt this off Mark's Aquatics. If anybody um, has subscribed to Mark's Aquatics, if not, I suggest you go and do it. But they'll actually release their eggs and hold them in their little fins just behind their pectoral fins. And they'll clamp those two secondary little fins together and hold the, the eggs there and before they go onto a plant and deposit them onto a plant. So there are quite a few different Otisynclus species. Um, I've sort of read up again in a good way. There's two main ones in the hobby. Now you can see on mine here, there's that big black bulge stripe that goes down the body. Then there's a tiny little space. Oh. There's a tiny little space before that big splodge before the ends, the tail begins. Now these ones are classed as O macrospelis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so this is what this one is, but I have looked on another one of my Octos and that tail stripe goes all the way down to the tail and that is actually a different species, but I can't remember what the name of that one is, sorry. There is also another one that's not as common in the hobby, which is the... Um, Oh, off he goes. So let's just uh, zoom out a bit. So there is another otto in the hobby that's not very common, which is the zebra otto, and that has more of the um, sort of natural camouflage coloration to it. Okay, guys. So I hope I've said everything correct there. Again, if I, you know, I am still new. I'm still learning. If I have said anything wrong or missed anything important, now please do let me know in the comments below. 